Today, like many other days, but today the sermon I have for you has a specific point. We're going to look at scriptures from the book of Matthew and the book of Daniel. And the theme that we've been covering right now is, what is the time? Like uh, people talk about, is it that the end times is like or is the end of the world type of a thing. And so I want to address that. But I want to address it in a way where you're getting the truth of what we do know without a bunch of speculation on things, many of which we just can't know, but in a way that allows you to go about your life tomorrow with peace, with excitement, with passion about who he is, but without having to be in this state of worry. Because that's not what the Word of God is driving and wants us to feel. Does not want us to feel alarmed or worried or like everything's completely out of control because he's not out of control. So I think today's message will be something that you can really use. And I want you to feel as though your, your life is moving in a direction where you are excited by the Spirit of God living inside of you. I think a legitimate question people are asking right now is, are we living in the last days? Are we living in the time of the end? Are we approaching the tribulation, if you're familiar with that? The book of Revelation talks about that, and the book of Daniel talks about that. So Old Testament and New Testament both talk about that. Um, and here's the thing. Realistically, after Jesus died on the cross, 40 days later, or well, three days later, he came back to life, rose from the grave. 40 days after that, he ascended to heaven. And 50 days after he rose from the grave, we have this day called Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit is poured out on the early church and empowers them, and they go out and begin spreading the gospel, and the sick are being healed, and the dead are being raised, and all kinds of amazing things are happening. On the day of Pentecost, the disciples are preaching the word, and people are hearing them in all different languages of their, their home nations. And people are saying things like, oh, you know, they're just drunk, you know, whatever. And Peter stands up and preaches to the crowd. And part of what he says is this is what the prophet Joel spoke of. Now, Joel prophesied this at least four or five hundred years before Jesus was born. But what Joel is talking about in the book, that book, hundreds of years before Jesus, it says, in that day I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And Peter says, this is what Joel was talking about. Well, really, the last days kind of started then. It's this new time where the kingdom of God has come and we can live under grace and we are approaching the time when Jesus is going to return. So we've been living in the last days, if you will, from a biblical standpoint for a long time. But are we approaching the time Jesus talked about I think the answer to that is obviously yes. Is, is time getting very short? Probably yes. Do I think you should start hoarding food and stockpiling everything? I'm going to expound on my answer for that. The easy is no, but I'm not telling you not to be wise. Let's look at first, let's go to Matthew chapter 24, because this is really where people start, and this is the disciples coming to Jesus and asking him specifically, when will all these things take place? And Jesus answers them. So let's look at this. It's from Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 to 14. This is the scripture people will talk about. You'll hear people say, well, the Bible talks about there's going to be earthquakes and all these things and wars and rumors of wars, and that's going to be the end of the world. It's not exactly what it says, but let's look at what it does say so that we don't have to question, okay? This is what it says. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, a really curious point here. When Jesus returns to the earth, in this time when the nations of the earth have compiled and they're coming against Israel to destroy it, Jesus will come back, his foot will touch the Mount of Olives, and will split it. He will defeat Israel's enemies and establish a government that he leads that will stay on the earth for a thousand years, according to the book of Revelation. So think of this. The disciples ask him this question, sitting in the very place where he will 
return, and they're asking him about this, okay? So they ask him, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. Let me stop right there. Have we seen wars? Yes. But think about this. We have inside of the last 120 years, 110 years, we have seen the two most damaging wars that man has ever faced. We had the Persian Gulf War inside of that time. We had Vietnam inside of that time. The Korean War inside of that time. The Cold War, if you will, all inside of that time. World War I, World War II, Cold War, Korean War, Vietnam War, Desert Storm. That's six major wars inside the last 110 years. So are we seeing wars? Yeah. Are we seeing earthquakes all over and now kind of in some weird places? There was like a 6.0 earthquake in Idaho not too long ago. So are we seeing those things? Yes, that means it's the end. No, we just read Jesus saying, but the end is not yet. These are the beginning of birth pains. Now listen, when a mom is, is coming to term and she's about to have a child, she might go into false labor. Braxton Hicks, been there, got five boys, been to the hospital and sent home. That is not an easy thing. But when labor comes, it comes on, usually have some time to get there, but it starts progressing and speeding up in intensity and frequency, and you have a little bit of a heads up of what's going on. Well, he's saying that birth pains are starting when you start to see some of these things, okay? These are about the beginning of birth pains, then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And they will, then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And, become, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So let's look at the second half of that. Is there a persecution of believers, of Christians, in this world? Yeah. Do all nations currently hate those who hold to the faith of the gospel of Jesus Christ? There's hostility. I wouldn't say that there's really a world government that embraces biblical Christianity right now. They don't all necessarily hate it. They're kind of pushing against it. There's definitely things are moving more towards a, a looser lifestyle and things being permissible that the Bible really would say that's not the way that God made the place. But can we say the second half of that is what we're living in right now? Well, that's not really a yes or no answer because it depends on where you live. If you're living in China right now, there are absolutely places where you could die for your faith. If you're living in Iran, many of you don't know this, but one of the fastest growing hotspots of the Christian church growth right now is in the nation of Iran. And the movement is led primarily by women. About 60% of the people at the leading charge of this spread of the gospel in the nation of Iran are women. If you live in India, there's a good chance that you could face major hostility for your faith. Probably a year and a half ago, a pastor that we support in India, a Christian pastor, his wife sent me a video of a young girl who had become a Christian, and she was actually attacked in the streets and doused with fuel and burned, and she died. Crazy stuff, but it does happen. So there is persecution. There are nations and cultures that hate Christianity and would just assume you were dead and are willing to make you dead. So does it exist at all in our world right now? The answer is absolutely it does. 
the bigger thing I want us to see in this scripture passage in Matthew 24. So what, what I was just talking about is, are we living in this time? We are living in a time that's an accelerating toward what Jesus is talking about here specifically. We are seeing all of these things. I think it will grow in intensity and frequency more. Will that be a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 100 years? That we can't know. Is it growing? Are we moving? We absolutely are. But there's actually a bigger point that I think we can live by today that this talks about. From the beginning of 24, 3 through 14 to the end, I'm actually going to read through it again. And I want you to listen for a, almost a bigger point than when and what. Okay, Listen here. I'm, let me read through it. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come. In my name, saying, I am the Christ, they will lead many astray. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And these are about the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. They ask this question. Does Jesus answer the question? Yes. But he says in two or three different ways, but listen, but wait, it, it's, it's not just about that. He says, be careful that no one leads you astray. Many are going to come and say this. People are going to do this. There will be persecution. There will be confusion. People will get sick of things and their love will grow cold and they'll begin to hate each other and turn their backs on each other. But the one who endures to the end, in, what does that mean, endures to the end? We are called to hold fast to the faith that we have in the person of Jesus Christ, in the good news of his coming and ransoming us, washing our sin away, and owning our lives, taking control of all that we are and all that we're not to make something of our lives that we could never be. And when his Holy Spirit comes to live in us, it brings what? We've been talking about this for weeks. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. And the Bible says there is no law against what the Spirit does in our lives. Jesus is saying, am I coming back? Yes. Should you need to know a little bit about what that time will look like? Absolutely. But don't put your attention on man. Don't put your attention on what one man says. Keep your attention on what I have said. And keep your attention on who I am. Because that will allow you to live no matter what the situation is around you. You will hear a voice behind you saying, Hey, son or daughter, this is the way. Walk in it. He will prepare you with the words to say when you're questioned. He can feed you like he did the children of Israel, manna in the desert. He didn't just do that for them. He did that for us so that when we face a time like we're living, we can know that he's able to produce and supply for us in a time of question, in a time when we can't come up with all the answers, we can't solve all the problems. What he's saying in this passage is not primarily write down all these things and watch and prepare and get your MREs together and your fresh water and go off the grid. He's saying, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you watch. There will be things that will tell you it's approaching, but don't be alarmed by them. 
Don't let your life revolve and rotate around them. Don't be overcome with fear and planning and trying to grab the steering wheel to have control and live through the whole thing. Listen, if you put away enough food for 10 years for you and your family and a person in need shows up at your door, what does the Bible call you to do? If you can't supply for every need that may show up at your door, that Jesus would say, feed the hungry, then you'd best be depending on someone who can. Remember the one who took five loaves and two fish? I hope you're planning on what you saved. He may miraculously multiply for your neighbors. But if the only thing that consumes your thought is your own survival through a rough time, that just doesn't sound like who Jesus was when he was here. I'm not telling you not to be wise. I'm not telling you not to plan, not to put things aside. That is wisdom. But if it causes you to turn your eyes inward and only inward, you are grabbing control back that you were never meant to have. I want to share with you one more scripture because Matthew 24 talks about things that we have been seeing as mankind from the time that he left. Have there been wars and rumors of wars this whole time? Yeah. Have there been famines throughout the ages? Yep. Pestilence. There have been some worse pestilences than we have seen. There have been diseases and plagues that have taken a third of the earth's population. We haven't seen that. So there have been times that are worse than what we are seeing now. So how can we know that the Bible is talking about where we are now, not where they were in the dark ages when the Black Plague happened? Well, let me read a scripture from you from the book of Daniel. Now, Daniel is a really amazing character because he, was, he gave his heart to praying for his nation, submitting to his God. Daniel, when he was taken out of his nation as a teenager and taken into a land of exile, he stood for what God had said in his life. And he lived in a troubled time when he was governed by godless people. And God blessed him in that place. And he served multiple kings in a land that was hostile to the God of the Bible. He was thrown into a lion's den and survived. His best friends were thrown into a furnace that killed the men who threw them in and they survived. In fact, Jesus was there in their midst in the fire. Daniel lived through rough times, but he served God in those places. And I personally believe that the treasures that the wise men brought to the baby Jesus in Bethlehem may very well have been the property of Daniel, who knew what to watch for prophetically and had educated men to watch for the sign of the coming of the newborn king and to take his gifts to him. God showed Daniel about 600 years before Jesus was born things that would happen 20-some hundred years after Jesus died. So I want to read to you something that this conversation going back and forth between God and Daniel in the end of the book of Daniel chapter 12. Listen to what's being said, and it applies to the world we live in today in a way that it couldn't possibly have applied to any time before us, okay? Daniel chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Is your life one that turns people toward who God is? He says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up, and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined. But the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. Now, I want to remind you of something, and it may not be a direct connection, but I was in a conversation in a Bible study just this week, 
And I mentioned this scripture, and a few people said, what could that possibly mean? You know, what's this book? Is there some book of the Bible or an extra chapter or two of Daniel that are lost and we're going to find them when it gets close to the return of Christ? And I said, let's stop and think for a minute of something we already have that could possibly be what God's talking about. Now, about 700 years after Daniel wrote this, a guy by the name of John, who had walked with Jesus, when was in exile on a small island called Patmos, and he wrote the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, it talks about a scroll that has seven seals on it. And John weeps because there's no one found worthy to open the scroll. And then one appears who is the lamb, slain for the sin of the world, and he is found worthy to open the seals of the scroll. Is this the scroll God's talking about in Daniel? Maybe it is. Here's the important thing. We have a God, we serve a God who knows what's going on. He's never been surprised. So how should we be living now? Let me tell you. The God that created this whole entire world, the God that knew every day you would spend from before you were ever born, the God that knows every word you will speak from afar off, the God that David speaks of and says, how precious are your thoughts toward me? How vast is the sum of them? I know this very well. The God of whom David says, where can I go from your presence? Where can I flee? If I go to the grave, you're there. If I rise to the heights, you're there. The God who told Job, where were you? When I told the ocean, this is how far you can come. Do you know where the mountain goat gives birth to her young? Do you know where the snow is stored up? This is the God we serve. We proclaim that our trust is in him. We pray a prayer that says, Lord, I am a messed up human being who's sinful and I can't fix it. But you are great and you came and died for me and you can fix what's broken. And I want you to come and live inside of me. I want to be able to say, as Paul said, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by the power of the one who loved me and gave himself for me. If you want to live by the power of the one who loved you and gave himself for you, then you are turning your life over to the one who made this, the one who, by the word of his power, holds together all that is. There's nothing to be feared when you live filled with his power. The only thing we need to do is keep our eyes on him. We can look wisely at the world we live in and say, hey, it's a fallen place. Is it going to get worse? Is it going to go downhill until he returns? Yes. Do I have to know when so that I want to know when to stockpile? No, you, you don't. Be wise. Make good decisions. But don't bury the gift for the fear of his return and you being caught shorthanded. Live. Be at work. Part of the parable that he tells right here in Matthew 24 and 25 is simply to say, be a workman who when the master returns is found doing what he was left to do. He will one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. It doesn't say that he will welcome you in and say, well done, good and faithful prepper. You made it through the tribulation and you had a couple gallons of fresh water left. Yeah. That's not what it says. And I want to caution you not to depend on yourself. Don't depend on yourself. Remember the parable where a rich man said, hey, I've got this massive crop. I'm going to build new barns and I'm going to eat and drink and be merry. This guy was planning based on what he saw right there. You can do the same thing in preparing for a time that you just don't know when it will be. Don't make that mistake. Be wise. Set aside some extra stuff. 
but depend on him. If God suddenly gives you a dream and says, hey, buy a month's worth of stuff, listen to his voice, but do not chase fear. One of the things that Daniel says that I specifically want to point out in closing today is this. God says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Has there ever been a time on this earth where man has run to and fro on the face of the earth more than now? Now, it is slowed down, but if I wanted to be in Australia in two days, I could be there. I can travel anywhere in this world at a pretty affordable place, and I can run to and fro, for goodness sakes, to drive 20. I'm going to be in Hamburg later today to pick something up and home. You couldn't have done that 150 years ago. You could have not done that in a day. How about this one? And knowledge will increase. I could take the phone I'm broadcasting on right now and ask Google who won the gold medal in the butterfly in 1960-some Olympics, and I would know that quick. That is a massive increase of knowledge. One more thing, curiously, that's talked about in the book of Revelation. There will be two witnesses on the earth that will proclaim the gospel, and God will guard their lives for a time. They will end up being killed and the Bible says that the entire earth will celebrate their death for three days and exchange gifts. Celebrating the death of these two witnesses that they're just sick of hearing their faces. I remember my dad saying 15, 20 years ago, he said, Dave, think about it. Before the invention of television and satellite, the entire world couldn't have possibly celebrated the three days those men were dead all at the same time because they couldn't have known in three days. They couldn't have known in a week or a month that these two witnesses had been killed. Until the advent of broadcast TV the way we have it now, that prophecy in the book of Revelation could not have possibly been fulfilled. But it can now. Do we have the technology to create a mark on every person? without which you can't buy or sell? Yeah, we could do that now. And there's a lot of people talking about what that might be. I'm, I need you to know that it is serious that we are living a time approaching the return of Christ. That is absolutely the case. You need to be aware of that. But the bigger picture is that we belong to Christ. And if you don't, then you need to. If he has not covered your sin by your surrender, you need to embrace that right now. And it's this easy. Here's the Dave Gable five points. This is really bad. I can't pay for my sin. I'm dead meat. You can. I believe you came and died for me to wash my sin away. Please wash my sin away. I am guilty and I deserve judgment. Please wash my sin away. And the ultra important number five here are the keys. If you are unwilling to turn over the keys of your life, then you still own it. And nothing you own is pure. Everything he owns is pure. You could say you have to sell your tail to save it. I believe that is the truth of the gospel. When you live in his hands, you live above all this. You live in a place where your steps are ordered by him, and the safest place you can ever be in life is in the center of his will. Listen, people, there is something worth living for out there. It will never be the 401k. It will never be the house, the car, the job. And this may shock you, but it's not your kids and it's not your wife. The one thing you are called to live for is a relationship with God himself. When you have that, you will have the love you're meant to have for your wife. You will be the parent and the lover of your kids you're meant to be. On your own, you'll, you'll fall short. That's why he says the most important commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. If you get number one correct, number two comes far more naturally to the spirit living inside of you. If you want to look like him, you got to love him and know him.